Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Kayla Betzel, and I'm the Sustainability Coordinator with the City of Louisville. Uh, I'm here tonight with Alyssa Bogan over here in the corner. Alyssa is the Sustainability Analyst with the uh, Town of Superior, and this is a joint effort with also Boulder County. So we have a few speakers that are here from Boulder County who will introduce in just a minute. Um, this is the second workshop of three scheduled currently in the Rebuilding Better workshop series. Um, and we do have information here tonight from workshop one, if anyone's interested, as you all walked in. And for those that are with us on Zoom, you should have received uh, the workshop handout uh, this afternoon. And for those of you that are in person, you also have a copy of that. If you're interested in the information from the first workshop, we have that information along with uh, some other educational information in the back. Um, so feel free to take a look at that. So here's a look at our agenda tonight. Um, as you can see, we have a really packed agenda. We have quite a few speakers, actually 11 different speakers tonight. So lots, lots of information. Um, and so, we are covering a wide variety of topics. We're kind of splitting up the agenda tonight into two different sections. So we'll start with rebates and incentives. Then we'll talk about induction cooking. Then we'll take a, a break for uh, Q&A. So if you have questions about rebates, incentives, anything like that, or induction, that'll be in the first break for questions. And we'll also make sure to answer questions from our virtual attendees as well. Alyssa um, is uh, monitoring our Zoom uh, over in the corner. And then we'll move into the second portion of the agenda, which is heat pumps, and we'll bring up a panel of experts um, that will answer questions about heat pumps. And then we'll have some additional time at the end for just general questions. If you have, if something comes up, you know, about rebates that you thought of during the second portion, we'll have time for general questions. And then we'll open it up around 7.30 for networking for the last 30 minutes. So if you have a really specific question, um, about your property, that's where you can seek out any one of the experts that are here tonight and they can help you answer your questions. Um, like I mentioned, this is a hybrid meeting um, and so we are monitoring the chat as well. So we'll be kind of um, speaking for the virtual attendees throughout the night. Um, and I did wanna mention again, the comment card. So we should have, uh, you should have all gotten a, a, a paper comment card as you came in. There is also a virtual comment card if you would prefer to fill one out that way. And all of the people on Zoom should have just seen that link come through on the Zoom chat. Um, I think that's everything for our introduction. We do have drinks available um, in the back. So if you're thirsty, we have coffee, tea, and water available. And we will get going with our presentations. I did want to mention quick, so before I hand it off to our speakers, chapter two of the Rebuilding Better uh, uh, website is um, building a resilient home. And so this talks about firewise building. Um, there has been some great webinars that have come out recently from the Colorado <clears throat> Green Building Guild. And so instead of taking up time during this in-person workshop, we're encouraging you all to visit chapter two of the Rebuilding Better website. That has all of the uh, Colorado Green Building Guild's webinars on there. And then we also have a link to the National Fire Protection Association webpage. And so that has all of the information about how to build firewise. So uh, all of that information is on there and we will move on to rebates and incentives. So I'd like to welcome Rob Buchanan. Rob is the Portfolio Product Manager for Excel Energy. He'll be speaking to you about the Excel Energy uh, rebates and incentives for rebuilding. Then we have Christine Berg after that from the Colorado Energy Office. She's a senior policy advisor. She'll be speaking about the Colorado Energy Office funding. Um, and then after that, we have Rick Garcia and Dave Bowman here from the Colorado Department of Local Affairs, and they will be speaking about the additional funds uh, and grants available for rebuilding. So with that, I will turn it over to Rob. Thank you all for being here tonight, and thank you all to our speakers. 
Thank you, everybody. Um, glad to be here tonight. Uh, my name is Rob McKenna. I'm the residential new construction product manager for Excel Energy. Um, so I'm going to have to turn my head because of the kind of monitor up here. So uh, this is a list of uh, our uh, incentives uh, for uh, rebuilding homes. Um, these are live during market. If we had to pay one today, we could. Um, but uh, you'll notice there's five tiers here. Uh, the first tier uh, is for homes that are built to uh, built in uh, built in places where IECC 2021, uh, which was uh, recently adopted uh, by both communities, um, where IECC 2021 is enforced, and you build to that code. Uh, all you have to do is build, make it a code compliant home uh, and you will receive an incentive of $7,500 from us uh, when the home is finished. Um, we are aware that the cities are offering opt outs of IECC 21 uh, to go back to 2018. If you exercise that opt out, even if you build IECC 21 and only 21, the, the $7,500 rebate is not going to be available to you. Um, and so uh, that's that's the first threshold. We want to make sure that uh, IECC 2021 is, is required where it's built. Uh, the next tier uh, above that is for uh, Energy Star version 3.2. Uh, the Department of Energy recently published uh, a new uh, Energy Star standard um, that is uh, uh, discreetly better than the old version. Um, it's about, and, and so, um, if you build, if you build, uh, find a builder who uh, is going to build that uh, Energy Star version 3.2, and uh, we get documentation of that, uh, that's a ten thousand dollars incentive. So we will, when the house is finished, we get all the documentation. We'll give you ten grand. Um, and uh, what's what's unique about all these advanced performance tiers beyond code compliance is, even if you opt out of the IECC 2021 and achieve one of these higher performance standards you are going to be eligible for the advanced performance tiers. Uh, beyond uh, Energy Star version 3.2, uh, we're stepping into, uh, the next one is the Department of Energy's uh, Zero Energy Ready uh, Standard. Um, that's another one that's been recently updated. Uh, and uh, as that, um, if that's the standard that, that uh, the houses meet, um, that is a rebate of $12,500. Um, and uh, so that's where we're that's where we're headed with this one. Um, that one uh, is based on Energy Star version three point two and has some additional requirements. Has some some additional requirements around it uh, related to uh, improving indoor air quality and uh, making sure that the home is uh, ready for PV. PV is not like rooftop solar is not required for any of these standards. So, it, but uh, for the zero energy ready, it has to be ready for. Uh, ready for rooftop PV at some point in the future. Uh, the next standard uh, is a brand new one from the Department of Energy, uh, from uh, Energy Star. It's called Energy Star Next Gen. Um, and that one was uh, introduced last October. And uh, we moved quickly to become, I think we're the first utility uh, in the United States to offer incentives for meeting that standard. Um, the requirements around that, again, is based on uh, Energy Star version 3.2. Um, but there are four components to that that you have to meet uh, to go for to, to achieve that. Um, the first is um, your primary heating system has to be an air source heat pump. The second is that uh, you need to have a heat pump water heater. The third is uh, induction uh, cooktop, which we're going to see a demonstration on later today. And then the fourth requirement is uh, for uh, EV uh, charging in, uh, in the garage. Um, if you meet those standards, uh, again, at the end of the day, when we get when we get all the documentation that everything's been met, uh, $17,500. And then the uh, the last standard that we're asking for, that we're looking for is, is passive house. Um, that is a, there, there are two governing bodies within passive house. We accept either of them. One of them is FIUS, P-H-I-U-S, and that is um, the Passive House Institute of the United States. And the other is PHI, the Passive House Institute. They made it really easy for us. Um, the uh, if you meet either of those standards, find a, if you get it designed and built to those standards, and you get to a point, the historically the actual certification has been very challenging to get for either of those. 
Uh, but if we get, we've worked directly with FIAS and PHI to define kind of an earlier hurdle that we're confident everybody's going, to, that, that we're confident that it'll qualify or achieve certification. Um, if we get the documentation of that, that's $37,500. Um, and so that's uh, um, the, <laughs> the dollar value we're putting out there is reflective of the difficulty of getting that standard. I wanna make that really, really clear, okay? Um, we can go to the next slide. Uh, the process uh, is uh, to uh, you know pick a uh, pick a, a performance standard and a rebate amount that you that you're interested in achieving, and uh, find a builder who's willing to do that. Um, we're we're still working on putting together a, 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 we're, we're working on branching out our builders, making sure we can find enough to make sure to, to uh, meet the demand for all the houses. Um, we have pre-qualification. Uh, we do have, we just finished a registration claim form uh, the other day. I brought copies of that uh, with us today. Um, I would, the, the registration form is something you, you, I'd encourage you to work on with, uh, with your builder and their rater, um, <clears throat> or if you're going past the house with a consultant to get us to, to uh, provide the documentation around that registration. Um, as far as when you should register, uh, the registration probably, Get, I would encourage you to get to get to a point where you're pretty settled on your home's design and the standard you want to meet before you submit that. Um, that that's just me encouraging you to, to make sure that we're uh, that that um, what you want is what we're going to deliver, and so uh, that's in, in strongly encouraged. Um, the pre-qualification, the registration uh, is uh, optional, but strongly encouraged for. Uh, every standard except for passive house. We are requiring it for passive house because again, we really don't want people to be up, to be disappointed if they try to achieve that standard and then fail to because it is different. Um, and then the when the house is complete, the submission, the aggregation of all the documents um, and the submission should be handled on the builder side. Um, in my mind, ideally at the end when your home is finished, you sign your claim form, all the documentation is already there. Give it back to your bill, give it back to your rater, they'll get it to us and we'll be able to pay out. Um, and so we're, we're working on getting that, uh, that piece finalized as well. And then uh, the, we've I've had a lot of questions come back uh, to us. The first is that um, the rebates do not stack. Uh, if you go, if you elect to find a builder who's going to do FIAS, FIAS requires Energy so 3.2 and zero energy ready as part of their standard. So you do not get 10,000 plus 17,000 plus 37,000. You, you, you get the high, the, the, the rebate will be reflective of the highest standard achieved. Okay. Um, the other thing is we want to be really clear that rebates may not cover the full cost of upgrades. We didn't design them that way. Um, we, I, I've, I had a conversation with a homeowner two weeks ago now. Um, and we want to be really clear that we, we don't, if you buy the builder for whom that covers the full cost, congratulations, but we didn't design to do that. And we want to make sure we're really clear that that um, that shouldn't necessarily be an expectation. And then the last one, uh, and I've, I've mentioned this a couple of on a couple of occasions, is that uh, PHI and FIAS, uh, they can't be met without additional designer and builder training. Um, if you're talking to a builder and you're, you say, I really want to get this passive house and they say, sure, we got it. Be, really careful with that they probably don't if they haven't if they don't have if they haven't gone through if they aren't passive house certified by either of the governing bodies so um that would be that that's a, a cautionary really for you guys to make sure you again that we aren't setting ourselves up to to, to be disappointed in the long run um there's a handful of useful links they don't really help you where we are right now but uh, we'll get those distributed uh so you can find um, most of these are going to link to, to information that by and large is going to be relevant for uh, for your builders, your raters. Um, but it's a resource for you to be able to for, for you to put it on the table and say, these are the boxes that you need to check to build the house that I want. So um, that's what these that's what these links are for. Right. And I'll hand off to Christine, who's grabbing some water real quick. <laughs> You were quick and efficient. Thanks, Rob. Oh, sorry.
So I'm going to jump in real quick. Um, I'm Robbie Schwartz. I'm the new home building advisor for Boulder <laughs> County. And I just wanted to add two things to, to what Rob said. One, if you have questions about what these programs actually mean, uh, you can reach out to me. And two, um, uh, Rob mentioned that it's, it's hard to meet some of these above code programs. But if you're shooting for those above code programs, you're, you're going to already meet the 2021 ICC. So you should be permitting under the 2021 ICC to lock, at least lock in the potential of getting that $7,500. Then you're shooting to get the, the other incentive payment uh, there, but, but you want to make sure that you permit under that, that, uh, that code in order to at least fall back and, and potentially get that, that rebate. And Rob, you confirm that that's what you meant when you said if you submit for 2018, you can't get one. Right. If you do opt out of the IECC 2018, the seventy-five hundred dollars tier is no longer available to you. All the advanced tiers are still. So if you find somebody for that, thank you. <clears throat> I think we're holding off for questions till later. Is that right, Kayla? Yeah. Yep. I'm Christine. I'm uh, Christine Berg. I'm from the Colorado Energy Office. I just slipped down the road in Lafayette. Um, it's really been uh, such a pleasure to be able to figure out a way for the state to help support you in your rebuilding, particularly as we. I'm going to steal this term. It's like building back, but it's also building forward and making sure that you have homes that really can be climate ready. Um, so we did pass uh, the Colorado Disaster Preparedness and Recovery Resources Bill, which is very wordy. And you're going to hear more about the uh, second component of that bill from the Department of Local Affairs tonight. But um, it does cover all state declared disasters from 2018 and into the future. Um, we received $20 million, so that's wonderful, and uh, there'll be additional programs coming from our office. If you have ideas about things that you think we need to be supporting for looking at electrification and high-performance homes, please talk to me about that. Next slide, please. Um, so this is the, the big announcement. We do have a, we're calling it a rebate. It's going to function very much like the Excel rebate. It's $10,000 for high-efficiency electric homes. Um, or long-term rental units, that's kind of a distinction there, that are built to the 2021 International Energy Conservation Code, and uh, or Boulder County's built towards standards, so whatever the current building standard is. Um, and NEEPS, so these are, there's three requirements, so I didn't want to purse this out. You've got to do these three things, which I must say is very similar to the Excel rebate for um, Energy Smart Energy Star, sorry, sorry, new certification. So those three components are, are the same, essentially. Um, so an electric resistant or induction stove, heat pump water heater, and uh, NEEP certified cold climate heat pump. Uh, we want to make sure that the heat pump you're putting in is the most efficient and makes the most sense for the climate and that you don't have to think about backup, right? So uh, can be combined with any Excel rebate, which is exciting. Uh, we're working on the, the application and then just as an addendum, incidental gas use is permitted. We're not saying you can't have any natural gas. We understand you might want a gas stove, uh, excuse me, a gas fireplace or an outdoor grill. We understand that. And that's incidental use. Those don't use a lot of energy, right? So they're kind of seasonal. Um, so that's kind of where the program's at. Um, we are going to work to get the application live, and we're working very much in partnership with the jurisdictions to ensure that that's, a, again, a streamlined process. Uh, imagining that you might go into the permitting office and you'll just fill out one quick form that says, yes, I'm going to do these things, and uh, we'll get that check after your house is built. So this is the beauty of this, because you can actually use the Excel rebate along with this. For this particular, the, like I said, the um, Energy Star new certification piece, that's 17,500 in addition to the 10,000, it's 27,500, I'm good at math. Um, so that's, a, I think, a beautiful um, incentive um, for you to think about. And certainly as we develop the program, let me know if you have questions, but we're excited. And like I said, there's, there's other funding that we can be looking at as well. So um, if you have other ideas about things that for, High performance homes that make sense that the state can help support, please let me know. And I, I think that's it. I'll hand it over to Kayla. Thank you, Christine. And we'll bring up Rick and Dave from the Colorado Department of Local Affairs. 
Rick Garcia is the executive director and Dave Bowman is the deputy director. So take it away. Thank you, Kayla. Good evening, everyone. Uh, as Kayla indicated, I am the executive director of the Colorado Department of Local Affairs. Our role uh, is working with local governments throughout the state. One of those many roles is working with local governments post natural disasters. Uh, we've worked with many uh, post fire, floods, tornadoes uh, in the natural disaster uh, space. I've uh, been here before, uh, making a short presentation. Dave Bellman is actually a program manager. He's the deputy director of our division of local government. He'll be doing a more formal presentation. But what I did want to at least uh, uh, share with you before I turn the mic and the presentation over to Dave is that uh, the Department of Local Affairs continues to be directly engaged. We've been involved with the Marshall Fire response and recovery since the, since the time it's impacted all of you. Uh, as Christine Bird just indicated, we've been part of the Senate Bill 206 uh, legislative process. Uh, there's a piece of the bill that is related to resiliency and rebuilding, uh, and that's the portion that Dave's going to talk about tonight. In fact, just this morning, we released a press release outlining how this program is intended to work to benefit the households that have been impacted, uh, primarily those who have been uh, underinsured or need additional resources to build back. So that's what uh, this presentation is about. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dave. I'm going to stand over here so I can kind of see the slides, but um, I'm going to start by giving you an overview. This first slide is about the grant portion, but there's a grant portion, there's a loan portion, and we're actually going to be coordinating with the Colorado Energy Office and the Community Foundation. And the idea is that all of these resources will be available at one stop. So you may be eligible for some of them and interested in some of them and not others. Um, so none of these grant requirements limit you from accessing the $10,000 from the Colorado Energy Office or limit you from requesting an additional loan. Um, and we also recognize that you know, we only have $15 million for the state funding. We're going to leverage that with some federal funding. We know that's not enough to fill all of the gap. So really the purpose of this money is is twofold. One, it's for those that are kind of on the fence and they're going, can I rebuild or do I have to, to pack up and sell my lot? We're hoping to incentivize as many people as we can to get those extra resources and make that decision to stay and rebuild their home. Um, and then for some of you, this will just be a little extra relief if you can either get a grant or a loan and make it easier to uh, to do that rebuilding and not have to, you know, dig as much into savings and that'll be help as well. So the first portion of this is a rebuilding grant. And I don't want to get too much into HUD speak, HUD is housing and urban development, but a lot of the federal funds is coming from those and they speak in terms of area median income. And I can try this. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we have five different levels depending on your area median income. And if you're at the 80% the of the median income, then you're eligible for a full $50,000 grant. And then it sort of tapers off from there. 100% gets 75% of the grant. If you're at 120%, which means you're over the, the median income for Boulder County, then you're um, down to 50%. And then if you're between 120 and 150%, then you get 25%. If you're 150% or over, you're not eligible for the grant. However, everybody is eligible for the loan. And that leads to the next slide. Um, so the, the rebuilding loan is available to all income levels. Um, we recognize looking at the SBA data that a lot of people either didn't apply or they were denied or they didn't complete the process. So this loan instrument is very similar to the uh, SBA in that it's about 1.5% uh, interest over 30 years. So it's much more favorable than you can get on the market. And uh, so you can access those uh, loan funds to help you in your rebuilding. Um, this one is of course capped at, at $50,000 and that's primarily um, you know, if you take $15 million and divide it by 
the number of people impacted. We just you know, don't have the money to fill that required gap. Um, some additional eligibility considerations. Um, this is not just for Marshall Fire. The way the bill was written, it was for every disaster between 2018 going forward. Um, we're hoping that those funds will revolve so if there's future disasters, we can also assist those. If you look at the, the nine disasters or so that occurred, uh, easily two thirds of the, the damage, just probably more than that, are in the Marshall Fire. So we're actually expecting most of the funds to, to end up with um, Boulder, Louisville, and Superior. Um, it is not available for second homes, um, vacation homes. And at this point, because of the limited resources, we're not opening it up to landlords at this point in time. If we don't have a lot of uh, use of these funds or it revolves back, we may open it up later, depending on the demand and if funds are available. Uh, the mitigation component, uh, we're still in the design phase of that, but we will have that out within the next couple of weeks because we want the, um, the recovery navigators that people will be going to be armed with this information as people are making decisions. It's not too different from the energy office idea, except instead of energy efficiency, we're talking about mitigation, fire resistant materials, vents, windows, those sorts of things. And we're modeling it off a, a program that Oregon has where they essentially have roughly $6,000 worth of eligible incentives based on a kind of a menu. So if you're thinking about, well, I want to do those double pane windows, but I can't afford it. Um, this might give you the extra incentive to help you, you know, do that extra fire resistance measure. Um, you'll see on here that we do have a link to the website, which has frequently asked questions, sort of, a, of an overview. And again, I want to emphasize that um, we are trying to make this as easy as you as possible and have sort of one door where you can apply for all of these funds, including the grant, the loan, the community foundation dollars, the CEO dollars, and we'll be putting the information out soon. And I'm sure everybody wants to know the timeline. Um, over the next month or so, we're going to be finalizing contracts, and we expect to have all the, the application available in August and September, and we're expecting the funds to start to be available September, October. So that's sort of a rough timeline. But the important thing is to get that information in your hands by the end of this month to help you make decisions on what you want. Thank you. Thank you to XL Energy, the Colorado Energy Office, and the Department of Local Affairs. Um, we will take questions on this part, but we, first we are going to move on to our next section and kind of wrap up part one of, of this program. So I'd like to welcome Rachel Brambolt. She is a residential energy advisor with Energy Smart. She was one of our speakers from our last workshop. So you might remember her uh, from our June workshop. And Andrew Forlines, he's the culinary director from Chef AF Consulting. And so he will be, Rachel will be starting us out, giving us an overview of induction and cooking um, and talk about Boulder County's program. And then Andrew will be showing us what an induction cooktop can do. So with that, I will turn it over to Rachel. Hey, so I'm actually gonna keep it really brief to let Andrew just jump into things. But what I will discuss is once you get done seeing his presentation, if you are interested in trying out induction for any reason, you want it, you want to see if you're going to like it to be able to achieve some of these incentives, we have affordable induction lending program that you can sign up for to try it. I will admit affordable induction cooktops are slightly different than what you're going to have installed in your home, but it's a great way to see how it works and really see how it compares to natural gas cooking. And really, um, I've got materials back there. So once we're done, you guys can take a look at what you could actually check out and also sign up for the program. I've got some QR codes to do so and just some handouts as well. But really, I'm going to turn it over to Andrew and give him some time to talk about induction. Sure. Well, thank you everyone for having me here. <clears throat> I'm Chef Andrew Forlight. Um, I run my own consulting, chefaf.com. Uh, business where I teach people about uh, modern residential appliances, um, not just induction, but all the others that are coming out and how to select and then use them. But today I'm focusing on induction to let you all know that it works and it works really well. Um, I will say that I've had induction in my home for the last several years. We've used induction in restaurants and hotels for years. Uh, 
um, to put the cold water in. So the induction is different than the resistant electric, that which gets blowing red hot. The induction is using an electromagnetic field to so interact with the metal directly, which means we don't have any spillover heat from the burner itself. The burner is only going to get heat from the pan back down, but it's not going to be glowing red hot. So you're not going to get anything cooked on there. It's going to be stay much cleaner, much longer. Um, you can keep it clean with just soapy water and then on abrasive uh, sponge. This to me, induction has made the old electric uh, obsolete in that this is 90% efficient. The glowing red hot electric is 75% efficient. You have to remove the cookware to stop the cooking process, right? And then all that heat is going to go into the house. Gas, indoor, residential gas is 40% efficient. So 60% of the gas you bought and are burning goes right around the metal before it can absorb the heat. And that's going to impact your air quality. Um, You've got a lot of you know pollutants there. The other thing that people don't realize is I work in a lot of these showrooms like Mountain High Appliance, um, Ferguson, Special Need, and I do consultations. People come in and they think that gas is the best when they ask me what you know what the best appliance is. And really it comes down to what's the best for you, for your lifestyle, and how you engage your kitchen. So you do want to approach it thinking and being curious about what's going to match you best. There's some appliances that are very high tech that are having touch screens and automation. And then there's some that are gonna be more straightforward or the manual transition, transmission kind of style. So I'm just gonna put cold water in here. And we're gonna to go to um, a high boil and then we'll turn it off to show you how responsive it is. So the complaint with electric is that it's not responsive. This one's got a fan built in to keep the electronics cool. All of your residential ranges will have that as well. But you won't be as noisy as this. Um, induction comes now, 30 inch ranges slide in. Cooktops, 30 inch, 36, 48 inch ranges. Um, we're there even seeing ranges that mix both. So you can get induction and gas. Um, there's a big difference between commercial gas and residential gas. And what we see on TV is commercial restaurant grade in gas cooktops and ranges. The BTUs on those, what I'm used to cooking with, um, starts each burner is about 40,000 BTUs. In a residential space, you're not going to ever find anything over 25,000 BTU. Most of them are in the 15 to 20,000 BTU. And that's your high burner, right? So, Gas is very underpowered in the residential space. We have different building codes. All the manufacturers are different from residential to commercial because there's so much different codes that they have to follow. You can only have so much heat coming out of your appliances. Um, so that means that residential gas really is lower powered. Induction is 35,000 BTU equivalent. So almost 150% of what gas can do. So when I'm using this, I'm usually about three quarters power is my high. Unless I'm doing a pot of water, which is thermally dense, you can go really high. The other thing working against gas is our elevation. The higher we get, the less oxygen there is in the air, the lower the gas can burn at. So you're actually getting less power and less efficiency. Um, so in ski towns, gas is going to take 30 minutes to boil a pot of water or longer. Uh, whereas induction is going to be really quick. I really encourage people to think about induction indoors for the air quality as well and ventilation needs. Your ventilation requirements for your cooking is on how much open flame gas you're combusting in the home. Right? It doesn't have to do with the smells and particulates. You're still going to want some with induction just for the smells, but you can might have a much lower fan. If you get a big range with a lot of BTU, um, you have to have a ventilation that matches that. We get over 400 CFM, it depends on the county, but usually it's around 400 CFM. Leaving the house, you have to have air coming in the house. That air's got to be heated and treated. And that's a whole other HVAC system, right, for the process. So you can snowball by getting a big range. And the ventilation requirement is based on all the gas BT if you had all the burners on, which I don't know how often everyone's got every burner on. But, um, that's the requirement. So with induction, downdraft is much more forgiving than it would be with gas. So downdraft allows for island cooking without a hood right over you. You can have it built into the cabinetry, the counter, and pull the air down, or you can have a pop up. So we're starting to get our um, boiling here. 
Um, and someone mentioned that the, the plugins are going to be a little underpowered compared to your ranges because the plugin is plugging into a, a 110 outlet, whereas induction is 220. Um, and then you're going to need higher amperage than you would on a traditional electric. So you're going to need about 50 amps is kind of the standard. So we got a boil right here, and I'm going to shut it off, and we'll just see how responsive it is. It's hard to tell on the angle, but it stopped already. Um, the cookware needed for induction, people are worried that it has to be induction specific. It just has to be compatible. Any metal that's magnetic, if a metal magnet sticks to it, it's going to work. So iron, anything that's ferrous. So aluminum and copper do not work. Personally, I don't like cooking on aluminum because it doesn't um, hold heat well. It's very spotty. Uh, but a lot of your entry level and non-stick pans are going to be aluminum based. I don't know where that was slides. Shouldn't do the thing. Um, so we'll talk briefly on this specific model. With Heston Q, that's what this system is called. The pan actually has a Bluetooth thermometer built into the handle, which means the pan and the burner can synchronize and will actually adjust the temperature uh, accordingly. So you can actually cook to temperature instead of low, medium, high. I can set it to say 350 degrees or 400 degrees. So you can really get that precision. The next step of that is that there's an app with guided recipes. So you can actually say, hey, I want this pre-programmed recipe, and it's going to guide you through it step by step and prompt you to, to flip food or add ingredients and that kind of thing. So really high tech, but very informative. So it's learning as people are cooking. Some of the younger generation own this savvy in the kitchen, so anything to help is great. Um, and then that technology is not to throw shade. Uh, <laughs> That technology is licensed in GE appliances. So we're starting to see some of this um, you know, startup technology get put into appliances. So GE's got that, and each one is a little different. I will say that induction across brands is very similar when you know they're, they're all competing for the same customer. So it's really not what brand is best, it's really what bracket do you want to spend to get into to get better, get best. Um, and across across brackets will be very similar. The induction coils are sourced by uh, one or two large manufacturers. So the brands are all sourcing the same components. It really comes down to the finish, inner, inner face, and aesthetic. So you can rest assured that you're gonna get a good induction regardless of what brand you're gonna get. Um, anything I missed on induction? I think so. Yeah, so I have cards here and in the back I do consultations, I do webinars on my website as well, doing um, technology in the home kitchen. My background in fine dining, I trained in Broadmoor, came up through there, so a lot of experience with that. And I think we did it. And I love it. Yeah, yeah, if you want to take one of these chairs, sure. um, uh, thank you to Andrew for that presentation on induction cooking. And that concludes part one of our program. So we'll take some questions from the audience. This is anything in part one. So I'll bring up our speakers, Rob and Christine. And if someone from the Department of Local Affairs would like to come up as well, we'll start taking some questions. All right. Uh, I just wondering if Andrew could talk a minute about the oven portion. Sure. OK, first question we have. And so I'll either repeat the questions or we'll have um, if the speaker, one of the speakers could repeat the questions, that would be helpful. Uh, first question is, can you talk a little bit about the oven portion of induction cooking? Sure. So induction um, is the surface cooking, the burner, right? When we look at electric ovens, we're looking at you know convection. We're now seeing built-in probes. So I can have a probe thermometer. And I can see the internal temperature of what I'm cooking, so you can put it in, and you're cooking to temperature, not just by time. So induction does refer to that electromagnetic coil, so it is more of the burner um, aspect. But electric ovens are, you know, even your gas ranges, and a range is when the cooktop and the oven are in one unit, even if it's gas on top, most of them are going to be electric, um, and we call that dual fuel. So electric is going to burn more efficiently. It's going to maintain a more even heat, um, and it's going to be it burns a little drier. But you know, a lot of the ovens we're seeing are, are not gas. You can get all gas units. They're usually 
less expensive. So that's one thing to consider. But um, yeah, so induction is definitely the cooktop. And one thing I forgot to mention was I, I appreciate that we said grilling's okay. Um, so what I do a lot with clients is recommend induction indoors for all the safety we talked about and efficiency, and then we can do gas outdoors. So when you go outdoors, you don't need ventilation unless you're at, under overhang and you don't have that BT restriction. So you can get the best of both. Um, it's just about how you, how you go about it. Okay, additional questions. Okay, right here in the middle. Yeah, so we talked about instilled gas usage, like your grills and your, your fireplaces. Uh, how do the instill rebates uh, take that voltage or at all? So the question is about in, uh, the incidental gas usage and how do the XL rebates uh, affect uh, incidental gas? There are no all electric requirements. So for any of the standards, if you if, if you have a use for gas, it's absolutely enough. Yes. Um, you mentioned that you could get an induction cook, uh, uh, range or cooktop, but you could also have gas with it. There was a mm -hmm. combination. Mm -hmm. How does that affect the rebate? How about how about we haven't thought of that? <laughs> no, I think it's a like some some it's some, a, some burner some some of the some of the cooktops are induction some are gas. Right, so some of the ranges, especially if they're forty eight inch. I don't think next year. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'd have to ask the Department of Energy. <laughs> we can follow up with that. Yeah, after. it's a good, it's a valid question. Uh, we'll have Alyssa to, uh, keep a list of questions to follow up on. Thank you. Uh, yes, in the back. Yeah, my question is going to go more towards the state. Unlike Boulder County and Superior, the residents of Louisville are being burdened with tens of thousands of dollars in fees to rebuild. Is the state looking to kind of help? Off balance those the burden that the residents of Louisville have to incur to rebuild, or is there something that uh, uh, we can apply for to kind of off, help offset those uh, thousands of dollars in uh, fees, rebuild fees that we have to pay that the other counties don't or the other uh, places do not? Rick's on it. He's <laughs> I wasn't anticipating political questions. It's not political. No, it's not. I'm just teasing. No, and it, it's a, an important question and one that certainly has been uh, asked uh, by your elected officials. And we've discussed that uh, within the governor's uh, operation as well as with the legal staff. And um, the, the grant program that Dave Bellman uh, ran through is the opportunity for you to get some of those fees and costs that covered. Yeah, but those fees get uh, distributed evenly between the counties. So since we're being burdened, more burdened, the people of Louisville are being more burdened, shouldn't we get more, um, get more of those incentives? I mean, why is it, uh, why is it we have uh, the residents of Louisville have to incur that burden while the other residents don't have to, well, Superior and Boulder County? No. I know the question has been asked and it's been discussed widely from a, a legal perspective. Uh, the state cannot uh, exempt sales and use tax. It's possible that maybe the local jurisdictions can, but that's up to the local uh, communities to make, to make that decision. Okay, let's do it right back here. Um, the heat pump requirement for the electrification grants, is that just an air source <clears throat> one or? Can I have you hold you that? Oh, or do you, you want to answer it? Because we have heat pumps coming up next, or do you want to answer? Are you talking about the state incentive? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they're the cold climate, so more specifically. Okay. Yeah. But that's air source. Right? To, to clarify, yes. I don't I don't know. You're asking whether ground source heat pump would qualify. Oh, oh. <laughs> um, it's like geothermal ish. Yes. We, we've had some conversations about geothermal, and I think we could figure something out. Yeah, there's definitely flexibility built into this program because that is a great energy source and super efficient. And so, we, yeah, we'll put that, that, that down as, as exploring like the opportunity. I, I think 
if I were to be unilateral, I would say yes, because I want to get folks the best homes possible. So we'll go here and then right here. Um, the rebates. Yes. Last time we, we talked about the rebates here. Excel, so on your website, it's not clear as you go through those. Is there anything that does a bullet point? For this, you need all of this. Next step, you need to add these four. So as we're working with a builder, this is what we're striving for. Yes. How much does it cost? Yeah, the, so the, the links that we sent out, they're not, they don't link to Excel, but they do specify what you need at every performance level. Is there one that, a tear sheet we can have them and say, what does it cost for this level, this level, or this level, as we're making our decisions? Or do uh, they have to look up every one and then figure it out? By and large, they stack on each other. So, so if the question, if the, if the if the question is, is there a codified list of the requirements of the requirements for each of the levels? The answer to that is yes. Uh, we haven't quite, we haven't published, we haven't. It's it's available, it's finished, and uh, but it isn't. I mean, to be to be really blunt, it's not prettied up yet. So we have the list. We have the list done, uh, and we can absolutely provide that to you. It would help in steering us. Yeah. Right yep. We'll find. We'll we'll find a way to get that. Is that on rebuilding better? It, I feel like we provided it. It wasn't. Okay. On your website, actually. It won't be. It. Uh, for a variety of reasons, our throughput is going to be mostly through rebuilding better. Um, so it won't be on the Excel website, but we'll find a way to get it on rebuilding Where we better. Can find it yep. Absolutely. Yeah, if we can make a note to follow up um, on the Excel, the itemized Excel on the rebuilding better to verify that, that'd be great. Yes, in the back. So for the average mean income, is that gross, is that adjusted, and what taxes would that be for? Because a lot of us most definitely haven't done our 2021 taxes because of the, kind of the fire issues. Um, there's a there's a whole variety of, there's more than one way to document your income. So it's not necessarily from your tax records. And typically the way it works is at the time of application, what is your income? Um, but they might, depending on what you have and, and how you get paid, they may ask for your um, pay stubs. They may ask for taxes if that's the best answer. There's, it, it, really, it really depends. And you'll work with an individual we're going to go to a few virtual questions from our Zoom attendees. So, Alyssa. All right. So, the first is for Rob. And for those that are online, they want to know where the registration form is, or did you raise it? It's not online yet. It's not, it's okay. not online. It, I asked very nicely for it to be put online today. <laughs> uh, that's the best I could do is to ask nicely. Um, but we have just, we have sent it out. Uh, Boulder, uh, uh, the rebuilding vetters got it. Uh, we're going to be distributing it to our builders and raiders uh, momentarily. Rachel looks like she has some bad. It, it is on rebuilding better now. Um, it is uh, on rebuilding better right now. On the Excel incentives page and the builders page. On the Excel incentives page and the builders page. So for those of you on Zoom, visit our rebuilding better website. Will the $50,000 loans put a lien on the house? Uh, someone read that SBA puts a restriction on a second lien being put on a house, and they're wondering if they could get both an SBA loan and this loan. Um, I think most people that get an SBA loan probably will not be eligible for this loan. The reason I say that is because the loan itself is based on your insurance gap, and most people are not going to have an insurance gap of over $240,000. So it's probably you should want to get both. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we'll get it. I don't, I don't want to uh, give an answer that's wrong. I'm not clearly sure on the mechanics of the lien. Um, obviously, the, the value of the home is going to be part of the collateral to make you eligible for the loan. But as far as the Specific on the lien, I don't really answer that off the top of my head. So. Okay, we'll follow up with that one. Next one uh, Are the income levels gross income or AGI? Um, it's going to be gross income. And in most cases, it's not based on your tax forms. There are 
some cases where that's the best route, but in most cases, it's going to be just you know what you make on a monthly basis. Just to follow up on that, what you say, gross income does that include dividend income? Because there's some of us that are more towards the retirement side, and we don't have a job per se, but we make money off of investments. Does the gross, the question uh, for those of you on Zoom is, does the gross income include dividends or is it purely just income based? That is a great question to put on our FAQs. And we'll be making mental notes. And we'll we are recording this, so that we have it in the record. Yes. Well. And we, we do have FAQs on our website. We will add those. That's a really great question. Thank you for all the great questions. The next one's for Andrew. Do you anticipate there being supply chain shortages with induction cooktops? <laughs> there are already supply chain um, issues with all of appliances. So er, um, order them early and often is all I can <laughs> um, You know, work with the retailer. I recommend the, the, the specific retailers of Mountain High or Ferguson or specialty. They specialize in these the, the appliances. Something people don't realize is box stores when you buy appliances, the install delivery is third party contract. Um, whereas these premium or retailers are going to have their own <coughs> certified technicians and installers who are certified by the manufacturer. 75% of the failures in the first year of an appliance are due to improper install. So it's worth maybe that a little bit more to spend. We'll do one more at Zoom and then we're going to go back to some in person. And for those of you on Zoom that didn't get your questions answered, we do a record of them and we'll follow up um, via um, our, our FAQs. Can Excel talk about how the Raiders coexist with the builders? Um, uh, some of the higher level uh, rebate um, sections need a Raider. So, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, raiders uh, in raiders are very raiders are typically contracted with the builders. Um, it'd be you'd be very hard pressed to find a builder that does not already work with the hers raider. Um, so uh, so they're um, the requirement for a raider should not be a hurdle because builders are by and large already working with them. Does that adequately answer the question? Okay. Okay, we'll take some in person. Yep, in the back. So following on that, would the the builder Qualified builders is a homeowner acting as a GC potentially qualified. Yes. <laughs> do the pre qualified builders? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, do, do uh, if, a, if effectively, if I'm interpreting your question correctly, please. Uh, if someone wants to basically be their own GC, do they still qualify for the rebates? Absolutely. Okay, right here in the front. I know you've had your hand up the whole time. <laughs> uh, do the costs of an induction cooktop and electric oven, how does this compare with electric total? Great question. So do the cost of induction, where is it compared to other versions? So I would say um, generally induction, the price has been coming down. Um, the more market share it gets, the more the manufacturers invest in providing quality uh, equipment. I would say the induction is about in line with gas, with, with nice gas uh, ranges and cooktops. It's gonna be a little bit more expensive than electric. Um, but when we think about the efficiency and the lower electricity use in the long run, that, that's something to take into consideration. Thank you. Next question, yes. Um, actually, I have two questions, one for the state and one for Excel. Um, so when you were going through that slides, uh, for the loan, you said you can't opt out of building code. So does that mean that we have to build to the 2021 code with the amendments in Louisville? Yes. Um, well, well, well it's, it's just the 2021. Just 2021. Okay. Baseline 2021. Uh, yeah. just, it's baseline 2021. Okay. Whatever the current code is for the county. Well, it gets complicated. I've worked yeah. on the building code oh, okay. stuff. So it, it, is, it is based like, yeah, sorry. I knew that. that. Sorry, Dave. Well, it was a long question. Yeah, throw code. that back to the energy office. So um, it's a great question. Our expectation is for both the DOLA and the energy office is just a 2021 IECC, not the appendix. We understand that we need flexibility, but we do. Uh, it's the International Energy Conservation Code. Yeah. 
you're parsing out like the thing and then the appendix. You, can you like yeah? What the, what is the appendix essentially? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So Louisville, when they passed their codes, I think it was in October. It included what we called stretch codes, so additional codes for solar that ready. Caused all the like brouhaha. Yeah, the brouhaha. Right. Okay. But we, we we do believe because this is something the state's working on anyways is standardized building codes, and we, we do have legislation to pass that we're gonna you know start. Um, asking communities to start thinking about those 2021 energy codes. So every three years, generally, there's a new, uh, there's new building codes that come out from, it's the IDCC. And so it, it really does matter because it is increased energy efficiency. It is long-term cost savings. And the difference between the 2018 and the 2021, regardless of what you may have heard, is a little under $5,000 and that does include inflation of about 20% because of the pandemic and all the other things that have been going on. Um, so it is worthwhile because you do have to build at least to the 2021 IECC to get any state benefits. And it behooves you to do it also with Excel. If that's your, your bare minimum, you get the 7,500, which will more than cover the difference in the two. Yeah, and then my other question uh, for Excel. So. We're thinking of a, a ground source heat pump. Mm -hmm. And for your 17,500, you have to have a ground source water heater. Yeah. Oh, it has a heat pump water. Air source heat pump water. The question was. Yeah. Um, so I'm repeating for the yeah. audience. So the question was if you're interested in a ground source heat pump, does it also require a ground source water heater? Is that well, a question? So they, I don't want to. I don't want to mischaracterize yeah, it. Yeah, the ground source is just a preheater. Yeah, or a superheater, water. right? Here. Yep. Um, are you going to require an air source heat uh, heat pump water heater for your finishing? Okay. Is what I'm saying. My understanding, and Robbie would probably be able to correct me. Yeah, Robbie, get up here. Really, when I really mis <laughs> when I really misstate this, yeah. the D superheater can feed into the heat pump water heater. So okay. you don't you don't have to have so you do still need a heat pump water heater, but the D superheater like you can still employ a D superheater to precondition your water before it goes into the heat pump, and that's all going to be that that'll be fine. Okay, but you Am still I, need an air source water heater. I think that'll be the expectation for I think that's the expectation for this year. Okay. We have time for one more question right now, and then we can save the rest for the, the end. Well, this isn't a question, but a clarification. For the federal tax credit, I think the heat heat in the super heater has to be added to the system. Right. Is that that's the the so the question was the D super heater D super heater is required for the federal tax credit. Um, that's for the ground source heat pump only. Right. Yeah. We're the um that's outside of that, that doesn't that is the, but it's they, a big consideration they feed they feed uh, differently you know 26 yeah. percent of the system cost did you want to ask yours um yeah because she had mentioned earlier that you had to have 2021 code for state benefits um but for those of us who are in unincorporated boulder county it's the equivalent you guys are actually above you're fine because uh, like it's different on every square yeah. footage. If you saw my slide, it's it's whatever the the code is, and Boulder County has their own system. The bills, So yeah, you're will fine. that count? Absolutely. Because we've never gotten clarification. No, no, no. Would. For all the state stuff and for Excel, it absolutely counts. If you build to the current Boulder County code. Okay. Is that if they, writing? If they yes. If they haven't. <laughs> yes. uh, I'm, I'm hoping I'm loud enough. Yes. I've never been accused of being quiet, yeah. so I hope you guys, <laughs> even on Zoom, can hear me. Um, if it hasn't been sent to you, that's uh, that's our fault. But it, you, it the um, uh, unincorporated Boulder County Code uh, has the same opportunities as IECC twenty one. Uh, IECC 21. We will leave no jurisdiction behind. Yes. Yes. Thank so you. We do need to move on right now. Hold your question. Write it down. Um, we we might have time at the end for more general questions, or else anything that's written on any of the comment cards questions will be answered in a follow-up communication after this. So for, for the moment, we'll have our uh, first part of our session speaker sit down. Thank you all so much. I'll pass it over to Robbie Schwartz. Robbie is 
uh, the new homes, you're on new homes advisor with Energy Smart. Um, he's going to be giving us a quick overview of heat pump basics, and then we'll bring up some heat pump experts for questions. I just come out of a uh, camping trip, so I have to get my brain back into uh, this. Uh, so the, the basis of a, of a heat pump, and the big thing to remember is that heat pumps move energy, they don't create energy, uh, which is, is a big, big difference here. So what we're doing is we're, we're talking about how energy moves. Energy um, moves from higher concentrations to lower concentrations, from hot to cold. Uh, is, is in essence of what, what you're doing. And it's always that direction. It, it never never does never moves the other direction unless you add more energy to the equation there. So uh, that's that's a big thing to think about. And so we, we wonder often what how how are we getting energy out of really cold air? If it's negative 10 outside, what does that really mean? And there the reality is that there's energy in that air when it's really, really cold. We're just not measuring it. The, the system that we're using to measure it doesn't take that into account. So when we're talking from a scientific perspective, we use the Kelvin scale uh, uh, there. And if you look at this, this little uh, picture up here, you'll see at um, Fahrenheit, at, at 32 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, which is freezing point, Celsius, it's zero. But at um, Kelvin, the Kelvin scale, there's 273 degrees Kelvin. Uh, there at, at, at uh, 32 degrees freezing point. So it's just an indication that there's, there's a significant amount of energy in that air there. And it's just how are we going to get that energy out of that air and transfer that energy from outside to inside to be able to heat our house in, a, in the wintertime there. So there's this basic, this, this refrigerant cycle out there that Lewis Carrier uh, uh, created or, or invented that gave, gives us to do it. So it's, it's basically um, moves that energy from one location to the other location using the refrigerant that's inside of these systems here. Uh, this maybe goes through a little bit more detail. And one, one thing to realize is that a refrigerator is a heat pump. You already have a heat pump in your house. A refrigerator is a heat pump and it works by moving energy across the boundary which is the boundary of the walls of the refrigerator, the door of the refrigerator, and it's, it's cooling uh, that unit there. So uh, this is, is really kind of the, the basis of the slide that, that we really want to talk about is what's happening out there. So if I have, uh, this is a, a real basic uh, air conditioning or, or refrigerant cycle here, where you have an inside coil and an outside coil, and you have of this compressor and the evaporator. So if it's 115 degrees outside, you know, the question is, how am I going to cool my house? Because I've got to take, I've got to take energy. I've got to transfer the heat from inside my house to outside my house in order to cool that, that house. So the magic happens at the compressor and the evaporator. So if I, all I have to do is make that refrigerant hotter than 115 degrees in order to move that energy from inside the house to outside the house. So it's not 115 degrees inside the house, right? So I'm pulling, I'm pulling a cold fluid across the heat exchanger inside the house. It's picking up some energy. And then I have to, and then I'm going to compress that, that fluid. And make, as I compress it, it's going to raise the temperature above 115 degrees. And that energy is going to go from hot to cold. It always goes from hot to cold or more to less, right? And the same thing uh, when I'm taking energy from the outside, let's say it's 10 degrees outside, I need to make that, that, uh, that refrigerant uh, colder than negative 10 degrees. So I'm going to expand it. If you ever use that uh, uh, liquid air or canned air to clean your computer or something, if you, if you hold that nozzle down, that can gets really cold, right? So if I expand, if I let that air expand or let, the, let that uh, coolant expand, I'm gonna drop the temperature of that coolant uh, below negative 10 degrees. And so that energy that's in that negative 10 degrees air is going from higher concentrations to lower concentrations. And it's gonna go into that refrigerant, come into the house, 
and you're going to be able to heat that house on a really cold day. So it's, 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 it's a great technology. It's super efficient because it's just transferring air. It's not actually, I mean, energy. It's transferring energy from one location to the other location. And it's super efficient. It's in fact, it's more than 100% efficient. When you think about a furnace, for example, a gas furnace for heating your house, if I, I the highest I can get is about a 98% uh, furnace. That means 90, roughly 98% of the, of the energy is, is uh, being transferred into the house. But I've got 2% of that energy that's going out, out you know, up the flue, in essence, to the atmosphere. But a heat pump can be uh, a coefficient of performance is the way that we measure it. And it's basically over one. If it's one, it's 100% efficient. If it's over one, it's, it's two, it's 200% efficient. If it's three, it's three percent, three hundred percent efficient. So these systems average at around three COP. So they're roughly, on average, about three hundred percent efficient at at transferring the energy because it's not actually burning something or or trans or taking the the energy uh, from an elect electric uh, cable uh, into uh, the system and trying to transfer that into the air, uh, which is really an efficient way of doing it. So. Because we're just moving energy from one location to the other location, we're able to heat or cool your house with one device, and we're able to do it in a very efficient, efficient way. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, okay next we'd like to invite our heat pump experts up here. Thank you all for your patience. You can stay. Do you want to introduce them? Oh. So as you all know, many of our rebates and incentives have to do with electrification for space, heating and cooling, um, and <coughs> water, hot water heating. Um, and so we have a, a panel of experts here tonight. First is Matthew Baker. You can come on down if you would like. We'll just do it that's similar to what we did for the last panel. Matthew Baker, he is the manager of electrification, utility, and government programs for uh, Daikin Comfort Technologies. Next, we have Brian Fowler. He is the owner of GeoSource Distributors, and so he um, is an expert in the ground source heat pumps. Uh, next, we have Sean Limones. He is the performance construction manager with Mitsubishi. Thanks for coming. And lastly, we have Bill Lucas Brown, who is the vice president of Zero Energy Solutions, and I believe will be our expert on the heat pump uh, water heaters tonight. So thank you to all of our experts. <clears throat> and we'd like to open it up to your questions, all things heat pumps. Yes. Um, can you guys talk about how a heat pump works together with an HRV or a ZRV, if at all? <laughs> I know Bill can handle this one as well. But yeah, uh, so the question is uh, how a, a heat uh, recovery ventilator uh, or an energy recovery ventilator will work with a heat pump in a whole home system, I'm guessing, correct? Yeah. So uh, ventilation is part of HVAC. It is the V in HVAC. And so it really should be an integrated or, or uh, included topic, right? It hasn't been for a long time, but as we improve building shells and as these buildings get much, much better than they were 10, 20, 30 years ago, we also have to think about how that air comes into the house, how it moves around the house and how it leaves the house. And there's opportunities to recover energy from that outgoing air. So an ERV, for example, brings in fresh air. It warms up in the winter. It'll warm up to closer to indoor air temperature. And, in this, and then as, it, as that, that fresh air benefits the house and takes care of the people and ventilates uh, pollutants, then the exhaust air will leave and it will leave at room temperature, if you will. And that room temperature energy will be the energy that goes in to help bring up the incoming air temperature. In the summertime, it's reversed. So it's uh, 90 degrees outside, we're gonna drop that temperature down to say 82 degrees or 82 degrees or something like that to recover some of that energy. Your question is about how does it interact and um, it really has to do with duct systems and how do you move that air around the house 
and whether it's a combined system or maybe it's a standalone <coughs> system, uh, it's all really part of the HVAC design and looking for a contractor and a builder that understands those nuances and interactions are, is really a key point. I don't know if I covered that from your guys' perspective. They work. Yes, sir, is that? Okay, uh, my question has to do with uh, how, how SEER ratings relate uh, with heat pumps and air conditioners, how they interrelate with each other. And what would be a good SEER rating to kind of look at, you know, a baseline and a, and, and a good above baseline rating? <clears throat> so the question was around SEER ratings and how they correlate between air conditioners and heat pumps. And what um, would be a good one? And what would be a good one? So I'll start off by saying an air conditioner is a heat pump. Uh, it's a heat pump that works in just one direction though, uh, whereas a heat pump as we use the term now is bi-directional, both heats and cools your home. So in essence, the rating, the efficiency rating, the seasonal energy efficiency rating is what SEER, SEER stands for, um, is applicable to both technologies equally. Uh, there are some new, there's some nuance to that in terms of how uh, how the system operates. If it's, a, if it's a single speed, two speed, or a variable capacity or variable speed system, um, there's some nuance to that. But essentially, the the uh, the criteria works just the same for both of them. When it comes to selecting your SEER rating, uh, the higher the rating, obviously your price point's going to go up, and that's where your incentives from. Um, from your utility company come into play. So I would encourage you to look at the ratings from uh, Excel as a great example. Uh, if you have Excel as your service provider, look at the ratings that they're, that they're incentivizing you to. Uh, code minimum uh, is establishes the, the minimum efficiency that you can purchase for your home. It's federally mandated. Uh, the energy codes in our state, or well, in our, in our local jurisdictions here in Colorado, um, stacked from there. Uh, your minimum efficiency is going to be, what is it, 14, 13 SEER? It'll be 14 SEER next year. Um, so anything above that is going to be better than the, than the worst that you can install right now. Um, a good target is generally in that 17 to 18 tier, uh, 18 SEER range. Uh, that's going to get you well above the minimum. Uh, but not up into the really expensive uh, equipment. So, but again, it, it's really, it, it, I hate to say, but it's a, a bit budget dependent as well. Let me ask a quick yeah, you can ask. I think what's most important for air source heat pumps in particular or ground source heat pumps is not so much the SEER value. It's more that what Robbie was talking about, that coefficient of performance, because we're in a heating dominated climate. And so we're sizing these systems to meet the heat loads of your home. So let's say it's 50,000 BTUs on a zero degree day. You lose that much in an hour. You need a heat pump that gives you that much. So you're trying to optimize that. And you don't get necessarily the highest SEER and the highest COPs. So you're really looking at COP more. And that system for, if it's gonna heat, a heat pump is gonna heat your home. It's more than gonna take care of cooling, right? Because you're you're trying to heat that home from zero to 70 versus trying to cool it from 100 to 70, right? You have much, much more power that's needed on the heating side. And so I would focus on that. And the other thing to focus on is cold climate performance. You know, both Daikin and Mitsubishi have really good cold climate performance. Can this heat pump, and this is for air source only, ground source, constant 50 degrees down there, more efficient, but more expensive to install. But if we can get good cold climate performance, meaning at zero degrees, that system can still put out that 50,000 BTUs and still have a decent coefficient of performance, that 200, 300% number, that's what you're looking at. Um, COP, coefficient of performance, HSPF, meaning seasonal performance factor, basically the same metric looked at in a different number. So you might see HSPF and it scales up the higher the better similar i'll let you pick up the last bit of that oh i don't really have anything to add to that uh, maybe from the geothermal perspective geothermal units are rated not in seer but in eer seer is basically an average efficiency over the season so it's really uh i mean there's some controversy in the industry if it's if a real number or not geothermal units are rated at a specific condition it's not average. So if you're looking at geothermal, you're not going to see SEER. You're going to see EER, which is a true 
efficiency of that <coughs> unit at a specific condition. And normally for a decent geothermal unit, you'll see an EER of about 20 to 25. <coughs> uh, so that would be considered a good number for, for a geothermal unit. Geothermal units are rated in COP, that is the heating efficiency. Uh, for a, a decent geothermal unit, they typically about a COP of four to five. So they're 400 to 500% efficient. And again, that's not seasonal, that's not average, that's at a worst case, uh, what we call entering water temperature, the worst you'll ever see is 32 degrees with the geothermal unit. So there is a lot of confusion when it comes to comparing geothermal to air source and lots of nomenclature that can really get jumbled. So that's kind of an overview of it right there. Right here, sir. I mean, if, what would be the cost difference between a traditional furnace and air conditioner with the heat pump, the air source heat pump? What would be the cost difference in a house? Could you repeat the question? What's the cost difference between a traditional, say, gas forced air with a traditional air, con air conditioner compared to a heat pump? A lot of variables there depends on the efficiency that you're comparing. But let's say let's take a kind of a basic generic air conditioner, gas furnace, 90% furnace, let's say a 13 serial air conditioner. Uh, compare that to a maybe a mid to upper grade air source heat pump. Uh, you're probably going to be about 20% higher, 20 to 25% higher for the for the heat pump. That's on that, and there's there's lots of variables in that in terms of equipment costs, in terms of uh, technician skill and the multipliers that they need to operate their business at. Uh, so there's a wide, wide range um, of, of numbers there. So it's really hard to compare apples to apples on it. But yeah, heat pumps are typically more expensive, but they are, there are savings there that are higher. There's also different tiers, as, as we talked about. So it's a, it's, it, I know it's not the right answer for what you need, but it just depends. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to this side. Anyway. I saw some hands over here. Way in the back. Um, why would you choose a uh, ground source over an air source? I know the ground source tends to be more expensive. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I'll start and then I'll hand it back over. Um, ground source is the more efficient system. Uh, there are additional costs in there, and I would also say it is dependent on the ground, uh, the nature of the ground that it's going into, and so, um, and also the, the skill of the designer and the technician as well. If it's not uh, designed or drilled properly, there can be challenges in the same way that there can be challenges with badly designed air source heat pumps. So geothermal, the advantage is efficiency uh, with the uh, aesthetics. All the equipment's located indoors. Uh, we're generally, uh, yeah, on average, probably twice as efficient as an air source because they're working with a stable ground temperature where the temperature of the earth never changes from 50 degrees once you get down about 60 feet. So that's the advantage would be, you know, from the homeowner <laughs> perspective, it would be energy savings and getting rid of that outdoor unit. Uh, but they are significantly more expensive because of the cost of the loop. It's called the ground loop. To get that, that pipe in the ground to, to use that ground as a heat exchanger, that is expensive. So more to your question, what's the difference in price? Geothermal is going to be two to three times as much as a traditional uh, furnace. How about monthly? Monthly. Monthly. monthly? monthly cost. Well, yeah, I mean, if you factor in what the cost of ownership is, you know, your energy savings will typically offset the additional. So if, you, if you're going to take that geothermal system, throw it onto a mortgage, if you're going to amortize the cost of that over, say, a 15 or 30 year mortgage, your energy savings every month are going to be greater than the additional that was added to your mortgage. So you basically start from a positive cash flow from day one because of those energy savings. Did you have something to add? Yeah, just a, just a little context. Um, the critical thing when building anything is to build efficiency, efficiency into the system first, right? The, the most efficient system out there isn't geothermal. It's not air source. It's not some magic anything. It's the system that's not used. 
That's the most efficient system. So build your homes right first, and code's already requiring you to, to do that. But to spend a little bit extra and tighten it up even beyond what code's requiring for air sealing, use a good contractor, use a, use a good energy rater that really is helping with that. So you're reducing those loads. We install mostly air source. And, and I'm, I have nothing against ground source. It is the most efficient. But if you spend the money on insulation and air sealing and good quality windows, making that shell envelope tight, getting an energy recovery ventilator to make sure you have good indoor air quality and a good filter, your loads are typically so low that an air source can easily meet those loads. And it, it really doesn't cost that much more. It costs twice as much monthly as a ground source. But are we talking $25 a month? Are we talking $50 a month? So it depends on the square footage of the house. So you just have to do your math and, and talk to someone who knows what they're doing. But ground source is awesome. And so is air source. But ideally, you build in the efficiency first, and then you size the motor to get the performance out of whatever vehicle, a semi or a race car or whatever you build. So you're going to have to size it appropriately. But build, put, some, put that into the, the shell. That's, the, that's, a, that's my opinion. Great, 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 great comment. Uh, the thing I just wanted to add is that's exactly why Excel Energy has the homeowner's incentives. Each of those programs that they're incentivizing, including the, the code minimum there, that which isn't a minimum, it's it's a, a good performing house at the 2021 ICC, um, is giving you a guideline, a, a, a checklist in essence, for how to build a house that Bill just described there. So you just need to pick your level and understand what it needs to, needs to happen. And really, you don't have to understand that. Your builder needs to understand that. Uh, they're working with their energy rater. And that's why when you go back to the build, that build being rebuilding better website, it, there's that big emphasis on building your team. Sure, you have a builder, an architect, an energy rater, your HVAC contractor working together as a team to achieve what Bill just described there. And you have a roadmap by utilizing one of those programs and incentive programs there. Yes. So, how much does an energy rater cost? <laughs> Generate <laughs> question. Uh, like I think Rob mentioned, energy raters are usually contracted through your, your builder uh, there. Uh, it, their fees um, vary uh, by energy rater, but in general, they, they touch the house at generally four different points. They begin with an energy model to help you qualify for code or programs and whatnot. They try to understand where your base specifications are going how those things are going to perform and they're projecting that uh, through an energy model there and you'll you'll need that energy model in order to qualify pre-qualify for these incentive programs uh, and and the code in essence uh, there then they'll touch the house they'll, they're always available for consulting and whatnot but they'll actually touch the house in terms of an inspection uh, usually uh, beginning the first one is usually right after the HVA system has been installed and before insulation. They'll do some level of, of inspection at that point. Then they'll inspect after insulation and before drywall. Uh, and then they'll inspect at the end of the process and do what we call a blower door test or air leakage test uh, on the house to see how airtight the house is. And they might offer additional services, services like <coughs> water management or other, other types of building science services uh, for, that, for that builder. But uh, that in a ballpark range is somewhere between 1,000 and 2,500 usually, somewhere in that range for the, those types of services. So comparing geothermal and heat pumps, what's the long-term difference in reliability, maintenance costs? Does that play into that initial cost and savings afterwards? Well, I would say anytime you get that unit indoors, it's going to be probably more reliable. It's probably going to last longer. Uh, there's been some studies done on that, you know, with geothermal units lasting 20, 30, sometimes 40 years. There's a lot of geothermal units out east, out in the plains, 
that were installed in the early 90s that are still running. So the, the maintenance and the liability costs not necessarily factored in up front, but that's part of what's called your life cycle cost. And really that's what matters, right? How much is that system gonna cost you over the life of the system or however long you live there? So generally maintenance would be lower than geothermal. Okay, we'll go to the back right here. Yeah. Well, kind of, just to add, oh, sorry. I would say <laughs> both companies standing up here have very long track records of quality manufacturing as well. So it goes back to the engineering, the quality, et cetera. Uh, you're going to see warranties in the five to 12 year range, depending on what and who. Um, but we've got equipment running for 30 years. As a company, we test our equipment for 30 years. You know, there's systems running from the, from the 80s as well. So it's not a comparison thing. It's just look for a quality piece of equipment. That's the point. Just just one, uh, you asked about the difference between a uh, ground source and a heat pump. Just to be really clear, a ground source heat pump is a heat pump as well. It's the difference is really the medium that you're drawing that energy from. One is from the ground, the other is from the air that's outside. So I just wanted to be really crystal clear about that. Thank you. Right in the back. Um, we've heard you talk about efficiency. We've heard you talk about a front cost, which can be significant with a heat pump. Um, some of us might be interested in the time to break even. So the question is about the time uh, that it takes to break even with a heat pump. So there are a number of recently released studies on um, cost effectiveness of heat pumps, both for air source and ground source that have been released uh, fairly recently. Um, I can't draw on those immediately and, and give you a you know, it really comes down just like we can't give you a cost for any generic system because there's so many things that, that factor into it. Um, it, it. But there, I will say that there are a number of research papers from bodies such as uh, Southwest Energy Efficiency Projects, uh, SWEEP, um, just released one a few months ago that gets into exactly that sort of thing. And I'm happy to share resources um, with the team here on that after this call, they can be distributed as well. But I can't speak specifically to. There really isn't one generic answer to that question yeah, because there's so many ballpark. variables. Can we give you a ballpark? What we do with geothermal and air source is model. We model every project individually because there are so many variables. What's the load? What size system do you need? What are your rates? What are you paying for gas? What are you paying for electric? All those things come into play. So. You know, there, like I say, there really is a one generic answer. Uh, Since you've modeled so many, can you give us a range? <laughs> of I probably could. I'll, I'll, I'll say this, there's, there's lots of variables, but let's pick a few, right? You have to replace, because it's been destroyed, the furnace and air conditioning that you have. If you had to replace it in an existing home and you're counting that cost towards, uh, towards the initial expense, it's drastically lower. So if you're talking about ten or twenty thousand dollars of replacement cost already, and then you're talking about two or five thousand dollars more to add on, the cost effectiveness of that, if you're, it depends on how much energy you're using. If, for example, in the home, but let's say you're spending a thousand dollars a year to heat your house, and now you're saving twenty percent. Now you're two hundred dollars a year. So you might be at 20 years across, uh, now I'm challenging my own math, but <laughs> if you're saving $200 a year for 10 years, you just save $2,000, right? Now you just get the factor in the, the um, um, cost of money, you know, cost of financing, cost of energy, uh, your ability to fluctuate, you know, um, when and how you run that system like Prius effect. Well, if you can see how much energy you're saving, then you might actually use more power and actually it's not a comparison. So there's so many variables that go into this. Yeah. But the reason it's kind of critical, and I don't I know the state may not want to hear that, but from a homeowner's point of view, some of us aren't going to be around 20 or 30. But but hopefully your kids will. <laughs> so here's here's just a tiny little bit of context. We're all talking about electrified. Why? 
I mean, we were, some of us were here in the 70s, some of us were older than others in the 70s, but remember all these inefficient houses in Grand Lake and these houses up in Evergreen that were heated with electricity. When electricity was too cheap to meter, that was fine. But then electricity are really expensive. And all of a sudden, these electric, big, giant toaster heated homes were four or $500 a month to heat. So electricity got a really bad rap. I've installed hundreds and hundreds of high efficiency gas units. But the only way we stop digging up fossil fuels and the stored carbon there is to switch to electric. Why? I can't create natural gas or propane or coal, it is a fossil fuel, it's all fossil fuel. You dig it up, you burn it, it releases the carbon. That's an issue, we think. We can see some numbers, we get some feelings that maybe things aren't quite right. Electricity can be produced from wind and solar. Renewables, Excel Energy right now, any idea how much of the electricity we're buying right here comes from a renewable source? 2%. Two percent. You're talking about nationwide, or are you just talking? So I'm talking about, about Excel. Just Excel here. Energy I'm talking about the electricity that's run in this light. How much of it is from a renewable source right now? Only when there's wind blowing, maybe twenty percent. Fifty-five percent. Only when wind is blowing. No, wrong. Total total energy use. So, and and I, and I don't mean to challenge you on it. I, I want you to look into this with Excel, and we have someone from here from Excel right now. Electrification is the only way we can continue to live the lives we want, to drive the cars we want, to live in homes that are heated with nice hot water that are warm and lower our carbon footprint. And so that's why we're talking about electricity. So that's the context. I know that I opened up a little can of worms here. And I, mean, all of that I have a happy question. Excel's going to 80% of renewable energy. Excel's going to 80% within eight years. You're, you are doing right by yourselves and the future, and it's it, yes, cost is a factor, but cost is actually quite similar for, for most that we found, but you are being responsible by switching to electricity. Okay, I know we have a lot more questions, so please write your questions on your comment card. We have about 30 minutes till the rec center closes, and so I'd like to leave some time for networking. Our, ex our heat pump experts will stay up here so that you can ask your question. We have Rob in the back from Excel Energy. Andrew's in the back if you have questions about induction, and Christine's over here from the energy office. So if you have questions, and our uh, Department of Local Affairs is here as well, so please ask your questions to our experts. Write your comments down on your comment card. Um, if you want more time for questions at our next workshop, 